Hi, it's Chris with Implied Music, and today I want to look at the interval of a tenth. A tenth is like a third, but wider, and the wide is what's great about it. Because we can make thick arrangements using only two notes. How many times have you thought to yourself, geez, I like this arrangement, but there's just too many notes in it? Or, I've got a great melody, how can I easily harmonize it or create something that's contrapunctal? Well, tenths. <laughs> All of my piano students play the Bach two-part inventions at one point or other. Uh, it's basic piano literature. And what Bach knew about um, consonance and dissonance uh, could fill many, many YouTube videos. Let's do a just a quick review of perfect and imperfect consonances and then talk about how tenths play into that. Every note of the major scale may be harmonized by any other note of the major scale, but there are very strong behaviors that tend to make us happy. Um, one of them is a third up. There's nothing about that which is unpleasant, right? It's got a strong tendency, it's got power, it feels uh, within the context of the harmonic language that we're used to hearing. Thirds are an imperfect consonance. Perfect consonances include the unison, two Cs, the octave, the fifth, and its inversion, the fourth. In a way, the unison is an inversion of the octave. Makes sense, right? Well, if inversions work, then we can have an inversion of um, a third, too. So, we do definitely love sixths. Now, the thing about thirds and sixths is they're kind of close together. It's terrific when you have um, two men singing in thirds or a, a group of singers all close together. Close harmonies sound beautiful, but in orchestration, in um, the full uh, spectrum of sound that we like to hear, it's possible to have much lower notes, much higher notes. And so, it's possible to expand, say, sixths or thirds to tenths. Here's the sound of tenths. All of those tones moved in parallel with each other and created a, a broad sense of harmony. Now, let's look at some of the examples that I've put together for us. Here's the first example, and it's very much like what I just played for you. The melodic lines on top, E, F, G, B, A, and it's harmonized a tenth below. E is harmonized with a C, but an octave down. You get a really thick sound this way. Listen to it. These tones are planing. They're moving at exactly the same time in the same direction. Truth is, in, say, cellos, violas, and uh, violins with some doubling, that would be a very satisfying sound. You could take the bottom note down to a double bass as well. Two notes. Each note creates um, an implication of harmony. The first moment sounds like a C chord, doesn't it? You hear the whole chord with just two notes. And then here, the F and the A sounds like a four chord. The two notes create enough juice for us to hear the harmony. We're taking advantage of the listener's um, knowledge, although it may not be conscious, of um, Western music theory and how things work. Well. Uh, the example of the 
two-part inventions of Bach is, is, a, is important because Bach didn't just let it rest. It wasn't just simple planing one-to-one -one because there are a couple of examples of things in his music and in many, many others, Baroque music particularly, where you have kind of a second species uh, counterpoint idea where there's twice as many notes in the top as in the bottom or in the case of over here, in the bottom as in the top. So listen to how this works. Here, the melody on top uh, is kind of double speed, but we're still in tenths down below. Again, we have a sense where the bottom line is almost like a bass line, and we're hearing uh, the harmony. Here, the A, which turns off the G and back again, is harmonized by an F, and so we really hear it as an F chord. We hear that as a C chord, F, C, we hear this as a G7, and it resolves to C. See if you don't hear exactly those chords. F, C, G, C. I'm only playing two notes, and yet we're hearing the implication of the whole chord. This is what tenths and imperfect consonances can do for us. It's a powerful tool only two notes. Here, the bass moves twice as fast as the melody. Except at the end. And again, we have that sense that there's chords happening. So my last example sort of breaks a couple of the conventions that we've established so far, because I've begun with not a tenth, but its inversion a third. And the reason I wanted to do that was I wanted to create a sense of contrary motion, which can be very exciting in counterpoint or any two-part writing. So beginning with the third allows me to go up in the melody while I go down in the bass. This moment here is all tenths, and then I go back to thirds. Tenth, sixth, which as you know is sort of the inversion of a third, so it's the inversion of an inversion. Sixths are great. And then it closes. So I go tenth, sixth, third at the end. Listen for it. And of course, if you know your Bach, you may recognize elements of, of the melody there. Let's listen to it one more time. Two notes. You only need two notes. The listener does a lot of the work in their own mind, and the harmony gets fleshed out by our expectations. Tenths, people, moving simply, planing together. Or in contrary motion, if you're feeling a little more sophisticated. Well, I hope this has been useful. Like and subscribe. Ding the bell. You'll be notified when I do my videos. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.